Last Lord's Day, we began a study of the doctrine of original sin as taught by what we know as Calvinism. We went to the Westminster Confession of Faith in the Presbyterian Book of Confessions and read from that exactly in their own words what they believe about it. To sum it up, it simply says that all men born into this world inherit the actual sin that Adam committed in the garden. Thus, his very nature is sinful. His whole being and every aspect is sinful. Not through any particular wrong that person did, but because when born into this world, that person inherited the very sins that Adam committed. We went ahead to talk a little bit about at that time some of the specifics in the doctrine itself, still focusing on the doctrine of original sin as we defined it then and defined it now. And then we gave some time to the fact that men do not inherit guilt, nor are they accountable for other people's sins. And today I want to emphasize something that every person needs to realize and that is that each person is individually accountable to God and will be judged of what he personally does or does not do, sins of commission and sins of omission, remembering that sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. Let me just be as clear as I can be, sin is what people do in word, deed, or thought. That which is not in harmony with God's will. Thus, when the Bible says people are in sin, or something like slaves of sin, or under the law of sin, it's simply referring to the condition of guilt and other consequences that one experiences because of his or her own sinful conduct. Now we want to look at a number of passages today that say a person becomes guilty of sin when that person commits or practices wrong and as the Bible defines wrong. Then you think of this doctrine of original sin as we noted in the Westminster Confession of Faith. And ask yourself the question, how is it that man can hold that view when these passages read as they do? And they contradict the doctrine of original sin and every aspect of the Calvinistic doctrine. I've already cited this one to you and I think most in this audience are very familiar with it. And that is John's writing in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whoever commits sin also co commits or transgresses the law. American Standard talks about lawlessness. Sin is defined as something then that a person commits or transgression. Not something he inherits like the color of his hair or color of his eyes from his parents. And uh, certainly has nothing to do with inheriting the sin Adam committed. In Mark 7, 20 through 23, we learn in this passage that a man is defiled, that is, he's made guilty and separated from God by things, and they're listed, which a person, again, does because of his own decisions of his mind. Now, I contrast that with the false doctrine of original sin that says you're born in this world a sinner, not because you did anything wrong, but because you just inherited Adam's original sins, and you're totally and completely depraved. Your whole nature is depraved. You're inclined to no good thing at all. That means you're not inclined to the words of the Bible, because the Bible's a good book, being it's God's word, but you're depraved, having inherited Adam's original sin, thus you can't be inclined to the words of the Bible. Thus God must move upon you directly to change you, if you're one of those that before the world began, he determined to be saved. Whether you want to or not, it makes no difference. And if you're one of those that he determined, predestined, foreordained, not to be saved, then Christ didn't die for you, for Christ only died for those he predetermined to be saved. And he only shed his blood for those who would be saved, but who would be saved, but those he predestined to be saved before the world was. 
If you look in Paul's writing in Romans 3, verses 9 through 18, and we often quote verse 23 if you want to add that on to it, we learn that all are under sin, verse 9. And the reason for that is is because every one of us has sinned, verse 23. We have turned aside, verse 12. We don't do good, verse 12. And so that explains how it is that we become sinners. Again, in that same letter to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 6, verses 16 and 19, we learn that people become servants of sin because they present themselves, their, their own members, if you please, as servants of sin and uncleanness. They choose to do evil, to do contrary to God's will, to violate His will. So when we obey sin, then we become slaves to it or servants of sin. Now again, think of how different that is from the doctrine of original sin. In James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15, we learn that a man becomes worthy of death or separation from God when he responds to the solicitation of the devil to do evil, which is the definition of temptation, by transgressing God's will. We are sinners when we disobey God. When are we sinners? When we disobey God. Sin and spiritual death then are the results. Spiritual death meaning spiritual separation from God. The results of what I or you do. Note again, each man, it says in the passage, each man, it's an individual personal matter. And it's true of each one of us. In James chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, we learn from the inspired writer that a person becomes, becomes guilty and a transgressor when he disobeys the law. And here the word has to do with stumbling. John 8, 34, a person becomes enslaved to sin because what he himself commits. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, Paul said to the young preacher that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say you love it and you become wealthy. It just says the love of it. Well, you can be a pauper and love it. You can be an extremely wealthy person and love it. You can be in any area of love of money. And if it takes precedence over anything else and causes you to violate God's will, then you have sinned. And it says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So original sin, though, says the love of money has another root. Inherited depravity. So I guess you'd say there's a root to the root, <laughs> if that were true. But it's an individual thought and act on our part regarding money, as it is in 1 Timothy 6.10, that causes us to be involved in all sorts of sin. The Bible says then the root is then in man's disposition of the mind, his attitude, his mindset, and not in the sin we inherited that Adam committed. In 1 Peter 2.22, Jesus was not a sinner because he did no sin. If original sin is true, he would have been a sinner whether he did anything sinful or not. Why? Well, he partook of flesh and blood just like you do and I do and all other men do. Well, if he did, then he inherited Adam's sin just like everybody else. But the Bible's full of material as we studied last week specifically that Jesus was not guilty of sin at all. So there's a contradiction here. Jesus was tempted in every point like as we are, the writer of Hebrews says, yet without sin. But if he become a sinner as you became a sinner per the false doctrine of Calvinism that is we inherit Adam's original sin then since he was like us in all things then he would have been a sinner so where's the passage that teaches that anyone is guilty of sin because he inherited guilt guilt from Adam or is counted guilty before he ever commits sin I suggest there are many other passages that refute this false doctrine. Let's notice, too, that eternal, our eternal destiny, all men's eternal destiny is determined by our own conduct, not by what we inherit. It is determined individually. 
Each person is held accountable for what he or she did, not for what our ancestors did. You know, it's always been a predisposition of us, mankind I mean, to blame somebody else for our miseries. It started right back in the garden. They had a commandment not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. But Eve was tempted. She took of the fruit and she ate. She then, then gave it to Adam and he ate. Now when they're confronted about this by the God who gave them the commandment, the comment was from Adam, the woman thou gavest me, she did give me and I did eat. Which is just simply saying it's her fault, but it's more than that. You gave her to me. Thus, it really was God's fault. Well, who does the devil want to get at? Well, he wants to get at God. So it's only obvious that when we sin, the devil's trying to get at God. So it's rather obvious, too, from the record in the book of Genesis concerning these matters, that man is also prone to say, it's your fault and not mine. And the doctrine of Calvinism pretty well does that. It's not my fault I'm a sinner. It's Adam's fault I'm a sinner. That's rather interesting. And of course, that would really mean it's God's fault. Because God made Adam. He got us in the mess that we did and that we inherited. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says to the church at Corinth, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? That each one may receive the things done in the body according to that which, which he hath done, whether good or bad. The language couldn't be clearer. Each will be judged for what he did where in this body. And this is true of all. Only Adam will be judged for what Adam did. Only Eve will be judged for what Eve did. The rest of us will be judged for what we did. In Matthew 7, verses 21 and 23, we learn from our Lord that we enter the kingdom of heaven or that we are rejected on the basis of what we do. Sin, then, is something people work or practice, verse 23. In Romans chapter 1, in verse 32, Paul says to Christians there that people are worthy of death for one reason, because of what Notice, they practice. But the doctrine of original sin says they're worthy of death because they were simply born guilty and depraved completely in their very nature through anything they've done that's wrong. No, because they inherited the sin that Adam committed. But that's just not what the Bible says. In Romans 2, 6 through 10, we learn, as we've seen elsewhere, that at the great judgment day, at the end of the world, when all things material and physical comes to an end, every man will be rewarded according to his works. Oh, by the way, not Adam's works. Tribulation and anguish will be for those who work evil, the Scripture says, and don't obey the truth, but they obey unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is simply that which is contrary to righteousness. Well, David says, all thy commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 172. Thus, if you're a righteous person, you have the right disposition of the heart toward God's truth, and you're submissive to it. But if you're an unrighteous person, you're not submissive to the truth. You've engaged in unrighteousness. Now, where is the passage that says a person will be judged or eternally condemned because of guilt he or she inherited from Adam. So original sin says every person is really passive. Passive in becoming a sinner. And even therefore passive in being saved from sin. So the doctrine pretty well that permeates the denomination says you can't do anything in order to be saved. Just like you didn't do anything in order to become a sinner. But these passages say to the contrary. This is the reason the doctrine of belief only in Christ. That's all that's necessary. Of course, even that doesn't uphold things because belief is an action of the mind. 
And that's what I've never quite understood. That they couldn't at least see that. So a person's a sinner because he does, um, before he does anything, and he's saved without doing anything. So there's really nothing anybody can do. It's everybody else's business. Primarily, that's God's business. The Bible says man is active, both in sin and salvation. He becomes a sinner because of what he does, and we will see that he must choose to act in order to receive God's offer of salvation. If we would just understand that there's a divine side to salvation and a human side to salvation, as God has made humans to come to a knowledge of anything and to appropriate anything by their free moral agency and ability to act, then we would know that God has done for us what we never could do for ourselves. But he's made it where we have to appropriate what he has done for our good that we could not do for ourselves by our own willingness to accept his will and comply with it. Well, if original sin is true, then babies are born guilty of sin. Told it he prayed. Destined for eternal damnation in a devil's hell. And I want you to run here, these little babies, little innocent youngins. If I were in a debate right now, I'd go pick one of them up. And I'd say, going directly to hell just because it's born a human. Because you see, that little baby has inherited Adam's original sin. And he said, well, that's being emotional. Yes, yeah, being emotional in the right way. It's also being very intellectual and rational. I'm just taking the doctrine they teach and logically applying it to exactly what they say. What else could I do if I'm going to express exactly what the false doctrine says? And if I'm going to show you what it means, just look at any little baby. That's all there is to it. I didn't teach the doctrine. I didn't come up with it. And the Bible certainly didn't. Well, it would make God some terrible ogre, some horrible thing. I've often pointed out that the God that reveals himself in the Bible and the God that created us and loved us and offered his son for us is not the God of Calvinism. That's a false God that does those things. All passages that we've already studied disprove what we have had to point out from their own books about total depravity, having inherited Adam's original sin. In sacrificing, think about this, if you go back to the Old Testament, where Israel had apostatized from the teaching of the law and been caught up in the paganism. And you see the pagans in the process of worshiping their false gods, they sacrificed their babies to idols. That may seem so horrible to us, it really shouldn't. We probably kill more in abortions than we, they ever did. So we're, if we can understand how people can't be bothered by that, you can see in that day and time in that culture why they wouldn't be bothered by the other. So we shouldn't be too, too really, oh, I can't see how they could do that. Doesn't seem to be bothering a whole lot of folks now in the millions that have been killed in the last few years before they were born. So in sacrificing babies to idols, people shed the blood of what kind of people? Guilty people? Little devils? Born in this world having inherited Adam's original sin and corrupted nature? No, the Bible condemns God's people at that time in departing from all manner of things the law bound upon them. But he says they were killing innocent people when they killed the babies. But if the babies inherited Adam's sin, really they'd be worthy of death because they'd be guilty of sin. In Romans 7 verse 9, Paul, a representative of people in general, was alive, he says, before sin came. But then he says he died. Well, how? If people are totally depraved since birth, verse 11. What he meant was he committed sin. It is a thing people commit. They either omit what God said is obligatory upon you to do, to be pleasing to me, or they violate, they commit sins contrary to God's will. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. There are other passages beside this. But Hebrews 12, 9 brings out clearly that our fleshly nature comes from our earthly parents. All the way back to Adam. The old genetics that we still have within us started all the way back there with Adam and Eve. 
So our flesh comes from Adam. But the Bible never does say that our spirits come from Adam. That is, it's fleshly. The Bible plainly says in Hebrews 12, 9, that God is the father of our spirits. But now if the doctrine of original sin is true, then what does that say about God? Well, he'd have to be corrupt too, wouldn't he? If our spirits are corrupt. But the doctrine of Calvinism says our whole nature is corrupt. Well, that pretty well covers the inward man, the spirit that dwells in us. But God fathered our spirits. So that's a reflection on God. What did I say earlier about really God is your fault? That's what the devil always says. Really God is your fault. Remember when the devil approached approached God at God's own request and even said, Now devil, take note. Here's a man down here, both perfect and upright, a man that hates evil and loves good. None like him on the earth. And what was Satan's response concerning Job? Well, you've built a wall around him. You've given him everything he ever wants. In effect, he's saying, you pay him to serve you. You take his paycheck away and you see if he'll continue to serve you. And you see then the rest of the book of Job showing us how that God said, all right. Eventually, he said, you can do everything to him you want to do to him, but take his life. And you know what happened? Job still served God because God is God. And that's all you need to know when it comes to serving God, when you understand what deity is. But the devil always says, no, it's God's fault. Everything is a reflection on God, and sin is the ultimate reflection on God, and yet sin's a lie. Who's the father of sin? Who's the originator of sin? Who's the originator of a lie? Why, well, it's Satan. Total depravity says man is wholly defiled in soul and body. So, give emphasis again to what I was pointing out. Does the sinless Father in heaven give us wholly defiled, totally depraved spirits? If the spirit comes from God, and it does, Hebrews 12, 9, and not from our earthly parents, how is it possible that we can inherit sin from our parents? You can hit it any way you want to as long as you stay with the rightly divided Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 And the doctrine of hereditary total depravity through Adam's uh, sin that we are committed when he, of that which he originally committed in the garden is just wrong. It's just wrong. It's wrong to be wrong and any other wrongs you want to put there. Matthew 19 verse 14 and 18 verse 3 we learn that the kingdom of God belongs to those who are converted. And he says become like little children. But now listen, if little children are totally depraved, they're inclined to no good thing at all, why should we become like them? Does conversion make us totally depraved? Of course not. That very statement, if there was nothing else in the Bible... Either has Jesus telling the truth about little children, that they're innocent, or he lied to us. He should have said they're little devils. In Calvinism, if he was true to that, he would have to say they're little devils because they inherited Adam's original sin. They're inclined to no good thing at all. Their nature is depraved. But Jesus didn't, did he? And that ought to say something about him. Jesus prayed for children and blessed them, Mark 10, 14 through 16. But you know, he, nowhere in the Bible does it say that infants, babies, little children need to be baptized for the remission of sin. They didn't need baptism. They didn't need conversion because they were innocent without sin, not guilty of sin. They need, didn't need to be saved. They were S-A-F-E, safe. Why? Never committed sin. Never separate from God. Notice this sometime in your study of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when he has Jesus with the children. Have you ever noticed he was happiest with the children? Notice that sometime. He was happiest he was with the children. You ever wonder why? Well, I think we've just seen why. They had no sin. And he was sinless. Suffer little children, forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Except ye be converted and turn and become as one of these little children, you shall in no wise into the kingdom of heaven. 
Well, how could they be guilty having inherited Adam's original sin and climbed no good thing at all? And he said, that's who you need to become like. First of all, you couldn't become like anything because you're born that way according to the false doctrine. But Jesus says, no, you ought to be innocent like they are. That's what the whole gospel system is, is to get you into that state of being innocent again through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary for the remission of our sins. This is my blood of the New Testament, he said, as he instituted the Lord's Supper, which he shed for many for the remission of sins. They didn't need baptism because they were acceptable just as they were. But how could this be if they were totally depraved? Now, the Bible teaches that sinners must be baptized to be saved, not baptism only. Baptism doesn't even come into play in the plan of salvation until after the Word of God you've heard and understood and the gospel message has caused you to believe from your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. It's necessary, Jesus said to the Jews of his day, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And now we know sins they committed and were accountable for. John 8, 24. They then were expected to repent of their sins. That is, become dead to a practiced habitual life of doing as they pleased and thus sinning and not caring. Now they've been renewed by the truth and they turn in conversion by resolve of the mind to say from that kind of life we turn because we have free moral agency and we turn to the life of from now on doing God's will. And thus they become dead to the practiced habitual life of sin at repentance. Then they are taught, as the scripture says, Romans chapter 10 verse 10, to confess before men that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Now they're qualified to enter the kingdom. Now they're qualified to be baptized for the remission of their sins. So it's a matter of qualification, isn't it? And in order to be qualified to be baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins, you must be led to such a belief by the truth of God's Word that it causes you to repent of your sins, Acts 17.30, confess your faith in Christ, and then complete your obedience to the gospel in being baptized for unto in order to the remission of sins. And thus the believing, repentant Saul of Tarsus from the gospel preacher that the Lord chose sent to him, Ananias, came to him and realized here's a believer. Here's one who's repented. He says, and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. You're a proper candidate for baptism. What are you waiting on? Complete it. Be baptized. Wash away your sins. Not in the water, but by the blood of Christ. But the blood's located... In the death of Christ, that's where he shed it. And thus Romans 6, 3 and 4 says we're baptized into his death. We're raised to walk in the newness of life. A new creature in Christ, when you rise from the watery grave of baptism, your sins remitted, and a member of the Lord's church, for he adds you to the church, Acts 2, 47, the realm of the saved. Now if you haven't done that this morning, you need to do it. The doctrine of original sin is as false as the word false could ever be false. It's contrary to the will of heaven. It's not in the Bible. And I've given you that today. And if you're a child of God and you sin, there is a second law of pardon and you need to repent of those sins, confessing them and praying God for forgiveness. Are you subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ to become a Christian or to be restored to the Lord? The plan's been set out, clear and plain in the divine volume. It'll mean on the day of judgment just what it means now. And we'll give an account someday of our lives before the judgment seat of Christ in the light of the divine word. Are you subject to his invitation? If so, we beg you come while we stand and sing. <laughs>